Hello, hello, hello. So nice to see everybody here. Now that I'm degenerating into the age where I'm becoming Uncle Dribble, I left my backpack with my computer at the airplane check-in on the way. I managed to retrieve that. I noticed it when I was getting on the plane and I rushed back and saved it. And then when I sat down feeling very smug this morning, I sat down to get my emails. I got a letter from a friend that I'd stayed with the other night in California saying, hey, you know that book, uh, your new book that you've cut up and annotated to do all these readings with? It's on my kitchen table. <clears throat> so normally what I do, this, I'll tell you just a little bit about the book. So, The Rain Man's Third Cure. In the song, Dylan says, The Rain Man gave me two cures. And he said, jump right in. The one was Texas medicine and the other was railroad gin. So I don't know what Dylan had in mind, but for my purposes, Texas medicine was peyote. And it stands for the ecstatic and the collaborative and the collective and the counterculture, a trope for the world of love. And railroad gin was to me the go juice of the robber barons, men and women who struggled for material wealth and fame and possessions and power. So I let it be for the world of power. And when I was young, I thought those were the only two choices, that you had love or you had power, and the trick was to get the mix right. Uh, love without power was flaccid and weak, and power without love was vicious, fascism. So about halfway through my life's journey, I got introduced to the idea of wisdom traditions. I got interested in Zen Buddhism, reading about the beats, but it took <laughs> a long years, a number of heroin addictions to settle into something that approached Zen practice. So normally, I say to people, and the w Rain Man's third cure is understanding this wisdom and making the decision to stay next to it. So those are the three cures, and there's actually only one cure because the first two are fictitious. So normally, being democratic, I say to people, this book is about love and power and wisdom. Show of hands, what shall I read? Love or power of wisdom? But since Uncle Dribble lost the book, I made a decision and I pulled something from it that feels particularly New York has to do with the world of power, and it has to do with my very dangerous uncle, Harry Palmer. So I'll read a little bit, and then uh, happy to paint a bullseye on my forehead and answer questions, if anybody's still awake. So here we go. My father had met Harry Palmer while they were both circulating through Manhattan's nightlife demimonde of boxers, managers, poles, wise guys, trainers, and gamblers. They met through a mutual friend, Whitey Bimstein, cut man and trainer to boxing champions like Benny Leonard, Rocky Marciano, and Rocky Graziano. It was a world of tough men, sharp glances, knowing faces, men who were quick to take offense, a world bristling with power and the itch to apply it. Harry had been a fixture in our home as long as I could remember, and though he was not a blood relative, he was always referred to as Uncle Harry. He was a tall, solid man with a regal reserve. I never saw him lose his temper or his equilibrium. But friends of my father's, men I recognized as normally high-status type A individuals, inevitably deferred to Harry when he entered the room. He spoke carefully and appeared unconcerned with what others might think of him, reserving for himself the power to determine how he would be regarded by others. It was like him to leave nothing that important to chance. Business suits were his preferred uniform and he disciplined his thick black wavy hair with pomade, combing it straight back without a part. While his overall affect was sleek, well-groomed and elegant, his broken nose and impenetrable self-assurance suggested a well-tested path past. Well, uh, I once asked Uncle Bert, one, I asked Uncle Bert once what Harry did, and his answer was as intriguing as it was mystifying. Harry's a fixer, he said, closing the subject down. When I pressed him for more experts, he offered some vague allusions to his being a leverage expert. Harry's backstory was as shadowy as the realms he operated in. 
I don't recall anyone ever mentioning where he was born or how he was raised. He spoke fluent Russian, Yiddish, and English, and I heard him speak Italian on several occasions. What elevated him in my eyes was the obvious respect and deference that he elicited from Morris, my father, my uncle Bert, and their friends. Harry was indisputably an alpha dog, and when Harry was around, even Morris was attentive. A kid could perceive how that marked him as special. I was curious to discover what the source of his power might be. From fragments Morris and Bert revealed to me, Harry's professional life began in his teens after a protracted and violent fist fight with two Italian brothers on the beach at Coney Island. The fight continued for so long and with such unremitting determination from the three participants that a crowd gathered. As the sun began to sink, absorbed spectators drew cars together to illuminate a ring in the sand with their headlights. The three boys fought to collapse, retching, gasping for breath, and unable to raise their arms. They were splayed out in the improvised spotlight and immobilized before the avid and cheering spectators. After the fight, Harry and the brothers became inseparable friends. The brothers, I never learned their names, eventually became made mafia members of high rank. Harry was reputed to be the only man outside their blood oath confederacy that they trusted completely, and he served them as a consigliere or counselor. Because he was considered incorruptible, he was employed as a judge in their interfamily disputes. The fact that he was a Jew and could never be a mafia member somehow made him acceptable as a neutral jurist. He dealt in cases that could have capital implications, Uncle Bert explained to me one night. Obviously, Harry had a privileged view of a very closed world. He understood perfectly how to frighten and manipulate men, and perhaps honed those skills while he was the partner of gangster Frank Costello, when both men controlled the lucrative slot machine concessions in Louisiana. It was Harry who was called to intervene when my grandfather was faced with intractable unions threatening to close his factory down. I overheard fragments of conversations as a boy, and I invented numerous reasons for passing through the room. Men had been imported. There were fights and bloody punch-ups which had occurred. Stories about Grandpa Jack and the baseball bat he wielded were codified into family legend. My grandfather Jack, my father's father, died suddenly in the winter of 1951. After pushing his woody station wagon for a mile through the beach sand where it had gotten a flat, my father was fully grown and preoccupied with his own affairs. That left the responsibility for Grandpa's business, manufacturing relatively inexpensive lamps and shades, to fall on my father's 15-year younger brother, Bert, at that time teaching English at Columbia and working for his doctorate in classical studies. Bert entered the C.N. Berman Company when it was reeling from a crisis of sales and the deaths of its two principals, Grandpa Jack, and his daughter Carolyn's first husband, Clarence Red Berman, his partner. The company had recently been unionized and its attorney was trying to negotiate the new union contract. Things were not going well. By his own admission, Bert was naive and despite good intentions to create pay incentives and reward workers for increased profits, the negotiations were stalemated. His shop floor was in a turmoil. And one day, reviewing a union newspaper, Bert discovered that the union business representative with whom he'd been negotiating, an aggressive Scotsman with a thick brogue and a brusque manner, was an obdurate communist who had publicly vowed in print to make an example of the C.N. Berman and Company and teach his members how to control a factory. Bert understood that the next round of negotiations would require more voltage than his company lawyers could provide. So he called his brother, my dad, Morris, who had extensive experience with unions during his presidency of the Hudson and Manhattan Railroad, currently the PATH train. Dad's facilitator in those negotiations was his pal, Harry Palmer. Morris feared, as he feared for me, that his brother was not prepared for the fractious, rough and tumble milieu of the non-academic world. He feared that Bert could not navigate the complexities of manufacturing, bargaining, union negotiations and sales, and most importantly, that perhaps he did not possess the requisite hardness. It was also his fear for me. 
Morris had no intention of being stuck with his father's business, and he had no ex intention of being slowed down in his pursuit of wealth by having to train his kid brother. The solution to his dilemma was to request Harry Palmer to train Bert to be ready for his appointed future. When the Dower Scott Union representative appeared for the next round of negotiations, Harry was waiting for him in Bert's office, and he instructed Bert to leave the room. The precise details of what occurred between the two men will never be known. It is known that the Scotsman abandoned the negotiations, walking directly out of the door after his meeting with Harry, and was never heard from ever again, except once when he informed Bert by phone that he was sorry that he could no longer negotiate with him because he would be killed. A previously unknown union appeared in the shop to negotiate for the workers. A contract was duly signed in short order, retaining Bert's incentive plans, but now clearly asserting management's absolute control of the shop floor. Harry assumed the newly minted office of Vice President of Labor for C.N. Berman, and I heard Bert explaining to Morris how the arrangement worked for Harry, because it afforded him a way to justify troublesome income to the IRS. Harry handled all labor issues for the firm, and there were never any labor problems again. With those difficulties under control, Morris then prevailed on Harry to teach Bert how to deal with people. Harry tutored Bert meticulously over the years, teaching him the skills required to bribe, cajole, and threaten others, and do whatever was required to advance his interests. He taught him to read adversaries accurately and size up competitive situations strategically. He taught him to search for and identify hinges and leverage points, weakness, fear, greed, where advantages could be exploited, and he taught him well. When Bert died, he managed to leave a sizable part of his fortune to his children. The same was not true of Morris whose fortune disappeared down the drain of history without leaving as much as a ring around the tub. But that's another story. <clears throat> Times I spent with Harry was time on high and thrilling alert. Simply receiving his attention was an honor. But the best days were those when he invited me to accompany him on his rounds in Manhattan. I'd spend the day bird-dogging his heels, maintaining strict silence when we were with others, if I became too present, a glance from him would back me up into the edge of invisibility. After first securing me a hot dog and a Coke, we'd cross to a particular corner near the Astor Hotel and stand in Times Square. Crowds flowed around us like water. The neighborhood was exciting. Billboards and seedy shops, flea circuses and variety stores where you could buy switchblade knives, dice, and playing cards with naked girls on them. Everything seemed vaguely illicit and fascinating. Neon signs flashed, Admiral, appliances, and Chevrolet, and everywhere bright lights appeared to be in motion. One end of the street was dominated by advertisements for whiskey. Rough people lounged against buildings scanning the streets as if they had nothing better to do than be alert. Movie theaters whose marquees announced the newest films offered the promise of endless entertainment, but from my point of view, why would I go to a movie about make-believe tough guys when I could hang out with the actual prototype? Harry might say, I got a couple of things I gotta do. Tapping an unfiltered Chesterfield against his silver lighter and firing it up nonchalantly. Do you wanna stay or look around? I did wanna look around and at times occasionally I explored Hubert's flea circus and the curio shops, but usually I preferred to remain with Harry. The fact that a man of such power and esteem chose to spend time with me softened the sting of my father's continual preoccupation with his affairs. I was alert but never tense around Harry, never feared frightening outbursts of violence in his presence. If I made a mistake or a breach of protocol, I was corrected quietly and privately without intimidation, threats, or accusations of my stupidity, but in a manner against which there were no appeals. Harry was kind to me and I loved him. I felt safe and important with him, included in the world of his respect and protection. Sheltered within his aura, I could take in the Broadway life as if it were playing out on a movie screen, catching snatches of conversation floating above the background thrum of the street. Among the blurs of sounds and colors, I could distinguish scents of wild root cream oil 
which my mom now let me use on my pompadoured hair. Lilac Vegetal, the sweet aftershave that my dad and Grandpa Jack favored. These smells mingled with the aromas of hot dogs, steaming bagels, juicy fruit gum, stale beer, and automobile exhaust. Harry stood in the midst of it all, immobile as an eternal principle, as the torrent of people rolled on around us. Occasionally individuals surfaced from the crowd's flow and presented themselves before Mr. Palmer. They scanned the street as they talked quietly, rarely making eye contact with him. It might be a detective from the safe and loft squad, known as the real deal detectives, usually reserved for the biggest cases, or a fighter with deformed ears or a uniformed cop. At other times, men dressed in suits with enormous knots fastening their ties stopped to chat. Occasionally, Harry would introduce me as his nephew, and he invariably described them to me as a friend of mine. At times, one of Harry's visitors might glance at me before beginning to speak. Harry's nod signifying he's okay made me as proud as a boy could feel. Harry's interchanges with everyone were invariably respectful, and he thanked them courteously for whatever boon or favor they might have done for him. On occasion, he might proffer a few words of the I'll speak to him variety, or an envelope, or a package might pass from his hands to theirs, or vice versa. Only rarely did Harry indicate that I should go get a Coke. The first time he suggested it, however, I missed his implied command and said, I'm fine, thanks, Uncle Harry. <clears throat> Harry pressed a $5 bill in my hand, enough for a 100 Cokes in those days, and said in a soft command, get a Coke and come back in 10 minutes. I comforted myself for being excluded by imagining scenes where Harry had to get rough with someone. When I returned, I had also bought a pack of gum. I informed Harry of this as I returned his change. I told you to buy a Coke, Harry said. His face was like stone. My blood turned thick and cold. Harry's face was pitiless, and I was terrified. I thought it would. I began to stammer out an excuse, but I stopped myself. I'm sorry, Uncle Harry. I owe you a nickel. I'll give. He reached out and tousled my hair, smiling. Forget it. You're my boy, but I want you to remember this, he said suddenly, completely serious. You never go into a man's pocket without permission. Never. Not even for a dime. Not even for a nickel. Do you understand? In certain situations, that could be a capital offense. I never did after that, ever. So normally when we parked Harry's car in the Manhattan garage, he simply left it and walked away. He didn't take a ticket, he didn't talk to anyone, or say how long he'd be gone. This day, however, he needed to retrieve something from the car, so we ambled back to the garage to pick it up on our way to lunch. There was no one in the office when we arrived, so we walked down a ramp to the next level and discovered Harry's car with the hood up and two men leaning into the engine cavity. Another motor was sitting on a little trolley beside them. The men looked up as Uncle Harry approached. Mr. Palmer, one of them began. This isn't your car, is it? Harry walked over and looked into the engine compartment where hoses and wires, now separated from his big Chrysler engine, were dangling. He never blinked. Nothing changed in his face. The man who had first spoken said, Oh, Jesus, I had no... Harry cut him off. I'm taking my nephew to lunch. I'm coming back in one hour. I'll be taking my car. Will we have a problem? The man swallowed like he was gulping water after a week in the desert. He became pale and began to tremble. He said, no, sir, no, Mr. Palmer, we don't. This was a total misunderstanding. The man's fear was so palpable that I became frightened and I edged closer to Harry. I had never, ever seen a grown man so afraid and I had no idea what might happen. Harry walked past him without responding reached into his car for what he needed and headed up to the ramp to the street. I hopped alongside him. What happened, Uncle Harry? What was that? That was really scary. Why were you scared, he asked me calmly. You were with me. <laughs> I had no answer to that, so he continued, they were going to change my engine for a little cheap job. It's good we went back, Pete. People do that, I asked. People do everything, Harry said, as we emerged into the daylight. Then he chuckled. Did you see that guy's face? 
He didn't know it was mine. What are you going to do, Uncle Harry? I asked nervously. Is something bad going to happen to him? Harry said, you should worry about lunch. To see Harry frighten another man was the newest refinement in my understanding of power. Years later, I was visiting my Uncle Bert, questioning him about Harry's tutelage in preparation for this book. Bert smiled slyly and confessed to me with tangible pride, I'm better than Harry. I waited neutrally for him to consider, to continue. Harry terrified everyone, he said, as if the fact amused him. They'd piss themselves when he entered the room. I don't do that. And he smiled like Walt Disney's magnanimous Cheshire cat. I've learned to make people feel they're doing me a favor, he purred, in a satisfied voice with the texture of slightly grainy butter. Bert went on to describe the restraint and delicacy required for a successful bribe to operate ripple-free and without blowback. My business has numerous competitors, he explained, and the products I manufacture are not unduly distinguished. Since his products were sold to various large retail chains, the fate of Bert's affairs, his family's well-being, and his expensive hobbies depended on cultivating the favor of the buyers for the chains and department stores that bought them. If my competitors bought the salesman a dinner or tickets to a show or a girl, I bought them a house, he continued brightly. I put their children through school. I remembered their birthdays and the names of their wives and kept them separate from their girlfriends. He recounted this as if he were fanning open a deck of personal skills. Bert's knowledge transmitted to him with demanding exactitude by Harry was that other men were available to be bought and manipulated to one's advantage. Bert acquired and refined those skills and along with them contributed his own refinements transmitting to his marks the understanding that he appreciated their flexibility as if it were a moral characteristic he prized. His skill lay in his ability to do this without ever ruffling their pride. Later that afternoon, I mentioned to Bert that I was toying with the idea of writing a book about Harry, long dead by then. Bert's response surprised me. It's been done. Shocked, I exclaimed, someone wrote a book about Harry? How could I not have known that? It's better than a book, Bert said, smiling mysteriously. I asked him what he meant, knowing well how deliberately details concerning Harry's life had been obscured. Bert inquired casually if I had ever seen the film A Bronx Tale, featuring Robert De Niro and the author-actor Chaz Pomentieri. I answered affirmatively and, to affirmatively and told him how much I'd enjoyed it. Then Bert asked if I hadn't noticed that Chaz's physiognomy and performance were the spitting image of Harry on every level, looks, behavior. I had to admit that it was as uncanny as if he were Harry's doppelganger. I was unprepared for what Bert said next. I play that film with the sound off sometimes, he said, looking me directly into the eyes. I talk to him, to Harry, he stressed, as if I might have misunderstood. I talk to him when I need him, when I have a problem. He elaborated that when he was troubled, a moving, living Harry in the room, even on his TV screen, comforted him and released, relieved his anxiety, a family trait. Somehow through this exercise, Bert's intuitions received a direct transmission of what Harry might have said if he was living. It was in that moment that I fully appreciated how precious Harry's mentoring had been for the younger Bert. Completely unprepared for his father's death and the responsibilities it demanded of him, he'd been ripped from the womb of his academic life and delivered into the cutthroat maelstrom of business, suddenly responsible for his mother's and family's livelihood. Harry had been his bedrock and security, and I felt drawn to my uncle by the intensity of our common loss. We talked about Harry long into the waning light of that autumn afternoon, and near the end of our conversation, Bert muttered something nearly inaudible. I assumed I must have misheard him and looked up startled. He regarded me without flinching, confirming what I thought I had heard. I held my breath to not disturb the intimacy of the moment. What he had said was, Harry was a life taker. 
I sat quietly while Bert rummaged through some papers until he found a yellowed newspaper clipping and handled it to me. It chronicled the daylight murder of two brothers in the street outside a burlesque theater on Lower Broadway in Manhattan. Harry owned that burlesque house, Bert explained. Those brothers were trying to take it away. Harry slept on the stage every night with a machine gun. There was a pause as he carefully refolded the column. This case was never solved, he said softly, replacing it in his file. One day I asked him, he said, Harry, why did you kill those two men? He looked at me like I was an idiot, and he said, because I could. And there it was, because I could. The blunt expression of will, as stripped of rationale and obfuscation as a Kalashnikov. Behind the bunting and rumbling below the cheers of the crowds, braided into the invented rationales and shell game of political facts, because we can is the eternal anthem of power, an homage to the will of men like Jack, Morris, Bert, and Harry, the ham-fisted men, the decisive men, those who will never accept the frustration of their desires. These men knew how to build empires and maintain what they had seized, they were hard-headed, immensely practical, strategic, and often fearless in the face of risk. I don't belittle nor condemn such men any more than I would condemn a grizzly bear or a Bengal tiger. They entered the wilderness of early 20th century America with its loathing of Jews and an economy already under control of society's most ruthless members. What they would own, they would have to seize. Because they did, I did not have to. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm fair game for any questions. Don't be don't be nervous. Yes. I'm actually going to have you use a microphone. That was very. Uh, it was great writing, and I've heard you're a great moderator. I've heard you on many documentaries. Uh -huh. I recognize your voice, and I'm Killed just my career as a bank robber. <laughs> <laughs> you and Lee Schreiber, two of my favorite uh, moderators, actually. <laughs> he takes a lot of money out of my pocket. Because <laughs> <laughs> the moderator is very important. It's an underrated part of a documentary. Um, just, just straying a little away from the book. I'm just. Are you? Is it okay to talk about the diggers at all? Because that's whatever how, you want to talk about. Th this is my introduction to you. Was the dig? Because I'm a friend of Rob for Boney, who knows Emmett. I don't know if you know Rob. It He's, sounds familiar. He used to be with Bonnie. It was Bonnie Ray. He used to live with her. Uh huh. Well, I'm a guy that leaves my backpack in the airport. So, <laughs> but I know Bonnie very well. We spend a lot of time together. Yeah, they 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 were together for years in the 80s and 90s. Yep. Anyway, okay. anything about the, the diggers, diggers. Just, just a bit about the th first things that comes to well, mind. Well, so people who don't know, the diggers was a gang, an anarchist gang in the Haight-Ashbury in the 60s. Most of us came from the theater. Most of us were artists and actors. And we really didn't want to buy uh, a kind of communist model. Uh, for actors, that seemed like a very thin soup, writing plays about heroic elevator operators or, you know, socialist realist painters of bus drivers. So we took as our task the imagining of a world and the making it real by acting it out, actually acting it out. And we figured that if people were not getting famous or rich behind what they did, they probably meant it. So we did everything anonymously and we did it without money. And we created theater events that people didn't know were theater. So for instance, we had a free store where everything in the store was clean and pressed and well-developed and you could get tools or clothing or furniture, or whatever you needed, but everything was free. And not only was the st were the merchandise free, but so were the roles. If somebody came in and said, uh, who's the boss here? I'd say you are. And if they just stood there like an idiot, there was no sense blaming the pigs or the man or the system for your dilemma. You'd been offered a gift and you dropped the ball. But if you got it and you said, oh, well, I hate the way these shirts are on display, I'm going to go change it. We'd say, fine, everyone would help you. And the, the purpose of the free store was actually to raise questions about, like, what's a consumer? What's, what's a commodity? What's, uh, why get a job to make the money to be a consumer if you can get the stuff for free and have all your time? So that was our goal. Our goal was not to work and not to participate in the larger culture. 
So that's what we did, and we did it fairly successfully for a number of years, and then we moved out of the hate, and we became, we merged with a couple of other families, one from New York called the Up Against the Wall Motherfuckers from the Lower East Side, a bunch of people from the Free Bakery and people who were inspired by us, and there's still 85 of us that are together in a linked group, and we're supporting some of our indigent members kicking in something every month, and although we don't look as wild and woolly, um, and you know, we all have to deal with jobs and money and kids. Well, no, no one I know has abandoned their principles and we just do the best we can. We're just not quite as pure. Did you come up with a name or No, 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 no. There was a guy from Brooklyn named Billy Murcott who was a kind of strange, curious genius who spent all his time on the walls writing charts and big historical events. The Diggers were an English historical group in the 17th century when the king stole the commons to use for his sheep, for his woolen mills, and the people under a fellow named Gerard Wynne Stanley went out and fought Cromwell's troops every day. And they were called the Diggers because in the morning they were burying their dead. And um, we picked up the name because they were the first people to overtly protest against private property. Yeah. And there's a Digger website. You can see it and there's a great song. Anyone? Mm -hmm. Yes? Just a moment, I'm gonna bring you this for our video. I know you've thought long and hard about the war on drugs in America, and I'm wondering if you would offer a little bit of uh, a tutorial about where Peter Coyote's head is on that subject right yeah. now. Yeah. Well, let's start with the fact that there has never, ever, since morphine was introduced in the Civil War, never, ever been a drug law that was not passed based on lies. Every gathering of doctors, mayor's committees, president's committees, even Nixon's committee, which he stacked to come up with an anti-drug agenda, said marijuana should be made legal, people should be given tolerance doses, as they did in England. I moved to England when heroin was legal for a period of time. You could get high for three dollars, and you could then go on and stay with your family and do your work, and that was the case for many, many addicts in America as well. There was no addiction until after the Civil War when a lot of people were addicted to morphine. And it wasn't treated with this kind of horror. And in the 20s, there was a doctor in Louisiana that had such a successful clinic treating people that they sent the feds to close him down. And the local police refused to enforce the order because they could see what he was doing, how he was keeping the neighborhood together. So basically, I think we have to think of the war on drugs as a way that police departments are protecting their budgets from being diminished after prohibition was over. The budgets were swollen from prohibition, and when that ended, they were desperate to um, keep the money, and they invented these scourges, and they used the, even the New York Times talked about coke crazed niggers, and they talked about people, black people getting high and raping white women, and they just, fired up the rubes and they got everybody terrified and you know they created a threat it's an ongoing you can't turn on the news without a threat and the threat seems to justify bigger police and military expenditures so for my money it's a medical problem it's a psychological problem it ought to be treated with compassion but then you're not using people as the fodder for an industry where it costs $50,000 a bed to build a prison, $35,000 a year to keep someone in prison, and they're using the prisons to replace the factories that have gone under and moved to China. So they're giving jobs to all these middle class people in upstate New York and out of the way places. So it makes a kind of fiscal logic, but it doesn't make any cultural logic and it doesn't make any compassionate logic. Was that clear enough? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the book's, the book's full of stories about different people that actually I met through this incredibly exasperating, difficult dad, but they were all delivered to me and they became kind of the, you know, the source material that I used to build a, a relatively <laughs> I can't even say sane anymore, but just a guy who can walk and talk without, you know, falling over himself. Anything else? Yes.
No. Oh, well, ladies first. Oh. Sorry. Oh, You're next. sorry. All right. Just in keeping with the news, it's been, I've noticed, and coincidentally to your arrival, that coyotes have been appearing everywhere. Yeah, I heard that. It, and unfortunately, also, with, in the age of Murdoch, they seem to be demonizing them. And the pogroms have started. So traps are being set in New Jersey, but except one was um, saved in Chelsea. So I don't know if there's any way you can help promote the well-being of coyotes <laughs> in your well, name. <laughs> you know, they're the Jew of the animal world. <laughs> and since, since the 20s, more than 25 million coyotes have been gassed, strangled, poisoned, blown up, and all they've done was succeeded in pushing them out of their range so they're now ubiquitous in the United States. I am uh, work with a group in California called Project Coyote and we have the entire county of Marin has banned the use of poisons and lethal controls and all the farmers have gotten either guard dogs or better fencing and of course what you learn is when you leave one uh, family of coyotes, they keep all the others out. And when you kill that family, then you get migrants coming through who, who don't know what to eat in that place and they eat everything. And we're trying to use this as a pilot for a federal program. But you know, it's just, um, look, you know, I turn on the radio and I watch these ads about how we're independent of oil. And I think it's like the captain on the Titanic coming out and saying, the pool's open, the water's great. <laughs> so we are assaulting nature and refusing to recognize our attachment to it, acting as if we're separate integers, as if we're not attached to oxygen, to sunlight, to microbes in the soil, to pollinating insects, to all the various interstices that are required to keep us alive. And you know, every, every generation is a life and death struggle between wisdom and ignorance. And there's no guarantees at all. So there's a lot of people out there who are doing good work and trying their best. They're sort of drowned right now in this corporatocracy we live in, where everything is conspired to turn the entire planet into money. But who knows? Who knows? You just have to stay happy. It's the only world we have. Yes, this man. I was just wondering, coming from such a, a proactive and politically motivated form of living theater into an industry where you're literally the mouthpiece for someone else's ideas, how did, much does your personal ideology factor into what roles you take and what you're willing to put yourself in in terms of films and projects? Sure. Well, you can always say no. And I'm actually trying to retire from film acting because I've aged out of the demographic where I get interesting roles. I usually get cast as a shithead in a suit. And, you know, it's just not very interesting. And while my kids were in school and I had to pay off their, their education and my mortgage, um, I just did it. You know, I was exploiting myself. I don't think that um, anybody's life has changed by a film unless you're in it. I think that the way you make the film is how you express what your values are. So I was always the first one on the set. I was always on time. I always treated everyone the same, whether it was a PA or the star. Um, I was always cooperative. Those were the values that were important to me. The content of the movie, I don't think I ever did anything that was really in violation of my, my political or human feelings. I did a lot of horseshit, though. I mean, I've done 140 films, and if I look at that list, there's maybe a dozen I'm, I'm proud of. So I violated the hell out of my aesthetic standards. But, you know, I heard a wonderful story about that. It's really germane. About 30 years ago, there was a big fight in Wyoming about the oil shale struggle. And the Indians and the farmers and the environmentalists were all fighting. And the Indians were really furious. Because they said, you know, 200 years ago you came here, you told us we were backward savages, you told us we didn't know anything and we needed to learn to farm and we needed to learn to drive cars and we need to come into 20th century culture. And now we've done that and now you're telling us that we were right all along and we, we had it down and what, what the fuck? <laughs> so 
an old man got up and his name was Teddy Rising Sun and he was a Cherokee and the Cherokees tend to teach through stories and little fables. So he got up and he, he told this story to kind of calm the crowd. He said, you know, one day I was driving my car and I stopped to get a cup of coffee and uh, in the old days we liked to keep an eye on our ponies and things. So I sat in the window and I watched, I watched my car. I wanted to watch my car. He said, and I saw a little bird fluttering around the hood and I thought, oh, maybe there's a teaching in this. Maybe. He said, and what I saw was little birds taking grasshoppers from the grill that were dead in the grill and they were taking it up and feeding their babies. He said, the only thing I didn't see, he said, was I didn't see any other little bird saying, that's not how we do things. <laughs> so he went on and he said, you know, a skunk rooting through the garbage is still a skunk and it's still raising its babies and it's doing the best it can. It may not be pure but it's still a skunk. And a red-tailed hawk on the wire that's feeding on dead mice on the road may not be pure, but it's still a red-tailed hawk. And that's kind of how I feel. The idea, we made a mistake, honestly, in the counterculture. Attaching ourselves to a counterculture condemned us to marginality. Because there were a lot of people out there, regular, normal, blue-collar working people who were not being bandaged where they were wounded, who were not getting a square deal, but they were not going to make alliances with us. They didn't want their kids around feral children and dope-smoking, long-haired hippies who were, you know, practicing random anonymous fucking. That was not in their agenda. So we were unable to really contact those people. But nowadays, those those uh, parameters have blurred and everybody's in the same culture, which means that every one of us can lean up against it someplace, in some way, and struggle against it invisibly and exert pressure by what you buy, by what you don't buy, by the work you dedicate your spare time to. So we were really snarky and judgmental to one another in the 60s. We judged a lot of people who were just trying to get along. You know, if you have kids, if you need a roof over your head, I know a lot of loggers that hated the fact that they were dropping redwood trees so fast that they splintered. They didn't even have a chance to lay beds of branches under them. But what were they going to do? Normally, the government could have hired them to work in the same woods and been repairing the streams and repairing areas. But that would have involved an active, proactive government. So I think, it's, I think we have to be tolerant toward ourselves and not so judgmental. Nobody's pure. But that doesn't mean that people aren't trying and aren't struggling to do the best they can. So that's the way I am. Now that my kids are grown, uh, I've given two houses to two wives, I don't need to make that much money. So I'm out of there and I'd much rather do voiceovers um, and write, which I can control the quality of by myself. I don't have to listen to a 12-year-old telling me what his film about vampires is really about. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Anyone? You got time? Otherwise, oh, yeah, wait, Michael. Matthew. I've worked with Peter as, as a director, and he was an actor, and he was an extraordinarily calm presence. <clears throat> and not only I calm, I was probably stoned, wasn't I? <laughs> no, not in those days. Not, not that stoned. I don't remember you being that stoned. But you were very calm and very humorous and a tremendous sort of presence on the set. <clears throat> But I wonder if you felt a parallel, if there was any connection you felt between the sort of gangster um, machinations of your youth and the lessons you learned in that and the way you kind of fought to yourself to prominence in the counterculture, which I remember myself to some extent as not being entirely without its own power struggles. So I wonder what the connection if you've made a connection between those two. Well, that's, that's actually an interesting question. Somewhere in this book, I say that until I was about 45, my life really felt kind of effortless. In other words, the people that I was interested in were the people that were doing the next new thing. I didn't really seek anything out or I didn't really have a, 
you know, I got interested in playing the guitar, suddenly folk music was everywhere. I got interested in the beats and, and, and Buddhism and living outside the system, and suddenly I was in that. So in the diggers, which were really a leaderless community, we didn't really have power struggles. The power struggles were, you know, within the weathermen and SDS and all of these people who were working on kind of Marxist hierarchical models. And the diggers felt that the American people were not going to throw themselves on the barricades to be lumpen proletariat. But that if they actually developed a life that they loved, they might defend it. So if I look back and I review, I could say we lost most of the political battles of the 60s that we struggled for. We didn't end racism, we didn't end imperialism, we didn't end free market capitalism, we didn't end the exploitation of, of uh, the earth. But if I look at the cultural battles, I'd have to say we won most of them. That there's no place on earth you can go today, I mean no place in the United States, excuse me, where there's not a women's movement, where there's not an alternative food movement, organic food movement, slow food movement, local food movement, where there are not alternative medical practices, homeopathy, naturopathy, acupuncture, herbs, alternative spiritual practices, Vipassana, Buddhism, Tantric, Yoga, you name it. And uh, let alone, um, I don't know, there are more, they're all over the place. You look at the news today, every channel has multiple black newscasters on it. People in public life being used as expert witnesses, being used as broadcasters. So it's not a perfect world by far. Well, let me get back to your question. So I was not aware of any particular power struggle because the diggers really didn't care about that political stuff. We had a different target and we were not really struggling against those people. We didn't want what they wanted. They wanted power. We wanted to change the culture. So most of our machinations were concerned with how do we make something wacky and fun and interesting and still have an inherent direction in it. Like, for instance, when we fed people, we fed 600 people a day. And to get food, you had to step through a six foot by six foot yellow frame we called the free frame of reference. That's all you had to do. And sometimes people would say, oh, no, no, I don't want to eat. I have money. I can buy food. And we'd say, no, this isn't charity. Would you like to live in a world with free food? And they'd go, oh. And they'd step through. And then we'd give them a little square on a shoelace. And it was their free frame of reference. And we just invited them to look at the world. Suppose this was free. So we were applying our artistic imaginations to try to jog people out of the entire mindset of profit and private property. And we just thought it was too simple and too boring to just take care of yourself. So we created systems where we take care of bunches of people at the same time. Are you the are you the signal the hook? <coughs> How are we doing? Got one. Okay, one last question. question one last question. Yeah. Uh, as a as a student who's uh, going to graduate soon and come into the job market, and uh, I'm looking at a lot of options, and I'm also looking at a lot of people who have been in the, the who have done a job for a long time, and I'm not really finding a lot of people who are very satisfied in the long-term career positions, and I'm wondering about uh, what advice you'd give to someone who's looking for a job uh, now and how to plan for the future, and what type of advice you'd give to be content in the future as an individual. Well, I'll tell you exactly what I told my children, which is follow your pleasure. That if you, if you do what you love, you'll probably do it more diligently and to a greater depth and more consistently than anybody else trying to do it. And, you know, at the end of the day, we have so many heartbeats. We have so much time. And I, I, never, I never heard of anyone on their deathbed saying, gee, I wish I'd worked more, you know? And so one of the things that's happening in the big cosmic hustle that's the United States is the vice is being closed. You know, people are being shoehorned into more and more work for less and less remuneration. I look at my son, I yell at him sometimes. You know, it's like he and his friends are sort of overwhelmed by how grim things are. And they don't pay any attention to politics. But I know, he's 30, I know when the time comes to raise a family, he doesn't have enough money. And his friends don't have enough money. So to me, the next heroes are going to be the people that figure out 
how to live on about a third of the income and a third of the energy without degenerating into squalor. We did. I lived on $2,500 a year for over 10 years. I never missed a meal. We had these old trucks that we hand painted and fixed and made beautiful, and we had our time. So that 40 hours a week that most people give up to work, we decided that was our priority. Now it didn't work once I had children and once our communal communities had children. Children needed a certain kind of order, they needed um, schooling, they needed a kind of stability. <clears throat> so then we had to come to terms with how do you do it without money. But you know the most, I don't know, the hippest thing I've seen in a long time is the Occupy movement. I mean they're the heirs of the diggers and they're the ones that are questioning the paradigm and put the one percent in there. So the, the game is up and more and more I think one of the reasons that white policemen are shooting so many black people is that they're bloody terrified. The whole thing is just crazily perched. All the people in Washington are crazily perched. No one knows what to do. And one of the reasons that I practice Zen is when things fall apart and get unstable, people who are calm and can see clearly are going to be valuable. So I would urge you not to be frightened. I would urge you to think deeply about what you want to do. I would urge you not to get hooked into status competitions about having the best and the newest iPad and stuff. You can get it used, you can get it on e eBay, you can have a full life probably on 30 to 40 percent of the income most of your peers in law school will be making. And it's up to you to decide if that's going to pay you off in terms of a life that's going to be enjoyable. I hope that helps. Yeah. Anyway, thank you.